And uh, now uh, I'd like to welcome up our, our featured guest uh, tonight. Um, you know, he's really, you know, I'm from Los Angeles. And, you know, he's, you know, after Michael Milken, you know, he's the legendary L.A. banker, uh, the CFO of my first company, uh, John Montazzi, one of the most massively talented people I've ever had the pleasure of working with, um, was one of the founders of Mullison Company in 2007. Uh, and now they're a publicly traded company, and they're the first major investment bank on Wall Street to start a dedicated global blockchain group. And under full disclosure, I'm a senior advisor, and, but this is the first time we met. So welcome, Ken. Let's give a hand. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> so I assume this is not your first WEF. <laughs> no, I've been doing it about seven years now. And, and how has it changed for you o over the years? You know, it's pretty much the same. I do. I use it for meetings. I don't go to a lot of the. It's it's a wonderful place to meet executives from around the world. I will say that it it has gone almost an extremely. Uh, I, I I'll just say climate change agenda from where seven years ago it just wasn't as uh, you know it was not as prominent and now it's the whole ESG and climate change is, is dominates the conversation. And so you spend your time now kind of just bouncing between meetings or? <laughs> well, we actually, we go to the conference center, which is, uh, you guys are way smarter than us. It's a total uh, <laughs> ripoff. But um, we get a little desk about this size. I won't tell you what that costs. <laughs> and, and we just have meetings every 30 minutes. And it's been funny because we've, we've had the same table for seven years. And people just, uh, myself and a partner, Eric Cantor, who used to be a, a prominent uh, politician in the United States. And. Well, I mean, more than that. Yeah, he, he was the uh, leader, uh, House leader, um, uh, uh, right below what Kevin McCarthy is now. But um, <laughs> it's funny. We sit there from about 8 in the morning till 6 at night, and people laugh at us because for seven years now, you know, it, it, it's good. You have, it's like having this house, have the same place. <laughs> and, and so are you seeing the same people or is it you new tend people? To see a lot. I try to, you know, prioritize seeing, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of Indian businessmen, a lot of Middle East, and look, it's a long trip to Mumbai. I'll tell you that. <laughs> so if you can, uh, if you can get ten meetings here, it's it's a great opportunity. So we try to keep the U.S. meetings out and and do the rest of the world. And so in the seven years, is this the first time that you've actually ventured out into? Dollars? No, no, I venture out. <laughs> okay. It's, uh, it, you know, freeze your ass off so you don't venture. But you know. I don't know how many have been doing it for a while, but the Belvedere was sort of the center of the of the of the of the entertainment. I don't know what they did wrong. They must have uh, gotten sideways with Klaus, but <laughs> you just have to get down to the Belvedere every night. That's funny. And is there anything different about 2023 than previous years? Any the way you describe it? Uh, you know, I don't know. I just got in today. Uh, it, it feels very crowded, though. It feels uh, alive. I don't know how many of you were here in May. It was uh, much. Uh, I, I loved it because you could leave and get some sunshine and take a walk. Uh, you can still take a walk. You just got to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and is there anybody this year that you're meeting with you know, or, or seeing speak that you're particularly excited about? Uh, you and this group. <laughs> um, no, you know, I'd say it's the same. But I, I do think one of the interesting things is, uh, you know, I've been doing a lot of work in the Gulf for a long time. Uh, one of our most prominent assignments was leading the Aramco IPO. And the amount, it's interesting, seven or six, seven, eight, you know, I, I'm not sure anybody knew why we were doing business over there. And today, I can't tell you the amount of conversation in business in the U.S. and, and Europe that is centered on accessing capital uh, and the opportunities in the Gulf. So, yeah, that becomes, uh, it, for us, it's repeat, but it's a very different change. They are the center, it's the center <laughs> of excess capital in the world right now. Yeah, it's really crazy. And I'm sorry, because I, I, I meant to start off, like, there's no Wi-Fi here, at least I couldn't get on uh, to look at the questions. But I meant to start by actually, you know, because obviously I know what Mullis is, but many people in the audience don't. So if you could just talk about the bank. You know, we're an independent advisor. We started in 07. It's kind of interesting. That was the crisis or right around the crisis. And what happened in the world, I think people were watching that testimony in Congress where literally the big investment banks were saying, yeah, we were on the, if you remember, there was some famous testimony where they were talking about stuffing their clients with mortgages. <laughs> I won't mention the firm, but they were prominent. <laughs> and, um, and they were like, yeah, but I thought you were representing them. And they were saying, no, we, you know, we acted like we represented them. We stuffed them with bad mortgages. 
And I believe it was, you know, lucky, by the way, um, just, you know, I do think a lot of career is luck. I started in 07. I thought it was the worst moment in the history of the world to start a business in the middle of a financial crisis. But it turned out to be the best because the world after 08, 09 said, you know what? We want independent advice. We don't want advice from somebody who's our counterparty. And if you think about it, a bank is always your counterparty. They lend you money. So uh, it just sprang out from the last 15 years as the world wanted an independent advice. So we don't lend money. We're not on the other side of transactions. And we're, we call it, you know, independent advice. So you don't have to worry that we're trading against you. And also very global. And very global. 20 offices. We went global right away. We're in Brazil. We're in China. We're in Australia, uh, Middle East. So we're 20 offices around the world. We're up to six, 700 bankers around the world. And, you know, uh, my belief was that networks, and you understand networks, same thing. We're an information network. And so the whole idea of is, was to get large enough that you had enough information that you could help your clients through what, you know, which is a personal information network. And I mentioned earlier in the introduction that Mullis was the first company to open up, uh, you know, to start a global blockchain group. Can you talk about how kind of the evolution of that? Yeah, well, one of the things I've always done, and, and when you go into these financial things, it's never, there's always a headline about Ken Mullis did this deal. It's never about that. It's about the people who will follow you and trust you and how much authority you give them. I mean, we are, it's, it's funny, I get to the economy a little bit, but, you know, one of the things I think the Fed's going to have a really tough job as they raise rates and they think they're going to create unemployment is there are firms like ours, and I think many firms who, in a world where assets are, are less tangible, companies' assets are less tangible and more digital, people are your, your business. And I, I don't think it's not going to be like 1977 where, you know, a couple of auto plants just laid off the workers and figured they'd get some guys to come back and turn the screws when they started selling cars again. I'm not going to give up my employee base. So it's a long way of saying we give a lot of uh, a leeway to our people. I, my number one thing is hire them and then get out of their way. I don't not even get out of their way. Support them. <laughs> Lou said, can I come speak? He's working with us. I said, what I say? I'll find yes. a, I'll find a way. I said, yes, right. I said, I don't know what I have scheduled. And so when John Mumtazi, his uh, banker, called me and said, I think it's time to start it. Um, I'm no expert in crypto, but I said, look, you're, you understand it. You know it. Let's do it. Let's get our, some of our top talent. And, you know, you could, again, you could say like the crisis, is it a bad time? We're in uh, and around. I think we're advising on, you know, three of the four. Maybe there's more than four large ones that I can think of restructurings that are going on. We give restructuring advice and, you know, how to restructure your company if you're in trouble, as well as M&A. Those are our two primary businesses. Yeah. So even, you know, during the downturn, the nice thing you about make more investment friends. bank. Yes. So look, uh, uh, you know, a little tip in life is you make a lot more friends on the downside. It, we started our business in 08. There was no M&A till maybe 11, maybe 10, the end of uh, 2010. We went right into restructuring and, um, you know, in 09, everybody needed help. And you make much better friends helping somebody in need than trying to chase somebody who's successful. And I say that even... You know, it's a good lesson in life. Our bankers always send congratulations when somebody closes a big deal. And I always tell them, look, you're going to be the 100th, 1,000th congratulations. But I'll tell you, Eric Cantor, just a quick story. Eric Cantor lost his race for Congress. He was the leader, and he lost the primary. He just, I don't, nobody, I, I still don't know what happened. <laughs> but it was stunning. And I barely knew the guy. I had met him once in Congress, and I texted him. I go, God, what can I do to help you? Um, this is terrible. What's next? He didn't call me back for a week. I said, yeah, I thought you might have been inundated with emails. He goes, no, yours was the only one. <laughs> he said, <laughs> I had to take care of my employees and find them jobs. But he said, nobody emails when you're down. And uh, that's he ended up joining the firm, which has been wonderful for us. He's very prominent. And, he, and it's just, you know, Think about it next time. People tend to avoid you when you're having a problem, and there's lots of great people who have a problem, and that's the moment to reach out and help them. And it's a great uh, – that's that's how our business got started. No, it makes a lot of sense, you know, talking about, you know, uh, uh, send an email to, you know, somebody when they're down. That gets us back You'd to crypto. You'd be amazed. You'd that be gets amazed. us back to crypto. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, look, we, so end up a lot, we end up in the middle of uh, starting this uh, organization, right, when – and, and by the way, I think it, once again, it's going to be very good for us because 
I hate to say it, I, 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 in the early days of VCs, like call it 2019, 2020, I used to go out and talk to uh, great entrepreneurs about their companies, and they had no reason to, they, they looked at me like, why would I talk to you? <laughs> why would I have a banker? I don't know. Uh, now all of a sudden, money raising is hard. Uh, people are restructuring. Relationships count. And you can see that happening. Um, and now all of a sudden you need relationships. And it's hard to form a relationship that you need when you need it. So, you know, form those relationships when you don't need them. It's a, it's a relationships are everything in life. The, uh, uh, when you talked about just in a, we'll get to the macro next, but so you're, you know, we're all here in crypto and you're over there at WEF. Um, is there, is there any discussion? You know, what's the, discussion like now has it changed you know really again i got here recently yeah. we'll see i think most people on that side um are happy i hate to say it they they missed it they weren't <laughs> in early nobody likes to miss a trend so as i i noticed that with all my friends who were outside they couldn't i think they were uh schadenfreude or whatever the word is they 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 wanted it not to work um which might be good because maybe it'll allow them to come back in and be productive around it. Once you miss a trend, you don't tend to chase it. But if it comes back down, you know, you might, there may be more uh, access and more willingness to participate. So let's finish on the macro economics. So, right, that's kind of the purpose of WEF. You know, where do you see us you know, kind of in the cycle? Look, I'm, I'm a believer this is going to be a very uh, long, tough year, maybe more. To my point, everybody is waiting for the Fed to break unemployment. I think it's going to be way tougher than they think. And um, I actually, you know, and I know I'm right in the heart of probably WEF and the heart of the wrong place to say this, but what the Fed has to break is the trillions of dollars of investment, misinvestment. Look, it's, it's, uh, that is causing energy prices to kill Western economies. You might not want to hear that, but... Um, there's, six, there's seven or eight billion people in the world. About a billion of them live in Western Europe and the United States. And I know we're very anxious to have uh, uh, an energy transition. But there's like a billion and a quarter people in India. Half of them barely can turn a light bulb on in their house. Uh, they cook their food over cow dung and people, five million people a year die because of that. They, uh, you know, and then there's a billion plus in China. It's literally six, seven, seven billion people in the world desperate to get to middle class. They are not cutting out their fossil fuels. They are going to get their pop. They're going to get their family to, to where you all are. Um, from what I can tell, I don't see anybody. It uh, looks like they're, they're going to get their family there and they're going to drive up. And so the fundamental problem is not unemployment and firing people. It's that in the UK right now, it'll cost you twice as much to turn on your dishwasher as it did, twice as much to heat your bathtub, 10 times the energy cost of the US. Western Europe has slit their own throat in the craziest uh, uh, fiscal industrial policy I've ever seen happen in the world. And, uh, and I'm sorry, wait, are you referring to Brexit? En energy, or, no, or, energy, oh, yeah. just pure just, energy. Just, and, and just purely cutting themselves off from what, you know, you know, from energy, from cheap energy. They've cut themselves off. They've, by the way, not many people, you know, again, I don't want to get on my, but you know, well, the, Pearl Harbor. Cheap, and I'm sorry, cheap energy being Russia? Russian well, Russia they or? put all their eggs in one basket. Brit UK had a chance to be self-sufficient and said no. They put all their eggs in one basket. Crazy, another crazy industrial policy. They didn't go self-sufficient. They are cut off. Um, and they continue to uh, block capital from going into cheap energy sources. And I think their population is going to let it be known that they want, it. they want to have an, a life. They want their kids to go to college. They want to be able to go to work in a car. And, uh, and, and I think that's the key, by the way. So I, look, what I'm saying is that's the key to an economy to drive inflation down. This is all energy related. It's, and, and, and to try to cause massive unemployment when turning on your dishwasher, last I looked, nobody probably has an employee, you know, doesn't, it, or, or turning up your bath doesn't require an employee. You can fire all the employees in the world. It's not going to change the cost of heating your house, turning on your dish. So this is, um, this is what the Fed's going to have to convince the world to stop allocating $6, 7000000000000 trillion to 
I get it, future, future uh, possibilities for an energy transition and come back and supply their population with the cheap energy they need. Does having seen these kind of it's massive gonna, That's mistakes, why it's going to take two years. What does it have, you yeah, know, this is the, even a more macro view, you've seen the states make these mistakes. Has your view of democracy evolved? <laughs> no, no. I mean, <laughs> I like it. It just takes a while. And the fact is, um, these, you know, I don't know how many of you here, again, I date myself, but there's a great book called uh, Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. And it happens, you know, it, the famous one was the tulip bubble and the South Sea, but, you know, there are, there are manias that take over. And, you know, I do think the mania, and again, I'm saying this at WEF, and I'll probably get killed for it, the, the mania of this moment is ESG. <laughs> and the, the for, forgetting that there are six or seven billion people, we sometimes forget it because, you know, the promenade is nice here. But there's six or seven billion people who are going to drive up the use of energy relentlessly as they strive to be in the middle class. So, I mean, obviously, you're identifying, you know, arguably the, the greatest problem we have. I completely agree with you. Um, but, you know, it, it seems unsolvable, right? What, what in the short term, it is. The transition is a long-term transition. It's a long-term transition. And you better not cause a revolution. You know, you better not cause... Um, you better not cause po lose your population while you're doing it. And I think we're, the whole thing's happening. Do not, I guess my, my point would be, do not cut out the ability for most of the planet to live comfortably while we transition. Let's transition and let everybody else live, live try to live into the middle class. The, uh, you know, in ESG, obviously what you said, standing up and saying what you believe when you know it might not be the most popular thing to say in a room. Um, for me, the most popular, uh, I'm sorry, the, the most important word in the English language to me is balance, right? Everything's, very few things are binary. Most things are balance, right? And so if you think about ESG, right, and that's the question, okay, what, you know, how much, you, you obviously think there should be some ESG, right? You know, thinking about the world is obviously at some cost makes sense. And the question is then where? And, you know, and me personally, I never think about where I want to be in balance. I think about where I want to be out of balance because you can never be in balance. So where do I want to be out of balance? I think the planet for, you know, up until now, I think has still largely been out of balance, not caring enough about ESG. And I realize maybe now we're caring too much about ESG, but. I don't know about that. I, you know, again, I, I, again, you're not, you're not. You're not looking at the six billion people who. Oh no, and I, I who, appreciate. Who, yes, who have not How do you been balance out of balance. That? I, yes. I think they deserve they deserve a chance to have a, a life. Yeah, and and they're going to do it. Look, you're not going to stop them. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah. So anyway, this is happening. It's, yeah. it's. I mentioned Vietnam. I mean, yeah, and Vietnam's even uh, further uh, along. Yeah, right. way so, further along than. So India. again, I, I get it in Davos, New York, London, yeah. uh, Washington D.C., Paris, London. They, they, you know, yes. I'm just pointing out the realities. Look. It's uh, just one of those things. I think one of my favorite uh, uh, quotes ever was, you know, you can avoid reality, but you can't avoid the consequences of avoiding reality. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll let you finish on that. Let's give Kevin right. a big hand. Thank you.